So far on this channel, we've looked at the geography of the Earth, Mars, and Venus. And now, anytime I make a video, even if it's completely unrelated to space, I inevitably receive a flood of comments asking for me to look at the geography of even more celestial objects, with the most requested one naturally being the Moon. But I'll be honest, I was a little hesitant about making a whole video solely on the lunar surface. I mean, making the geography of Mars took me longer than any other video I've ever made, and in a lot of ways, making the geography of Venus was even harder, mostly on account of how featureless most of the Venusian surface truly is. But hopefully, at the very least, the reason I covered these two planets was clear. In one way or another, both serve as extreme analogs for the Earth, and by studying how their geologies, geographies, and potential for biology all affect one another like the volcanism, erosion, and magnetic field of Mars, or the plate tectonics, greenhouse gases, and orbit of Venus, we get a better understanding for how all these factors work together here on Earth to sustain an environment capable of supporting life. The Moon, on the other hand, lacks any of the gifts of a larger celestial body. No volcanism, no magnetosphere, no tectonics, altogether impeding its ability to build an atmosphere. Without an atmosphere, the Moon's surface is exposed to the harsh vacuum of space, where no climate, no weather, no clouds, no moisture, not even wind can arise, making it absolutely impossible for even the most resilient of organisms to survive here. And therefore, on a surface level, the Moon as a whole offers us little insight into the inner workings of the Earth system. Knowing this, the next thing I had to ask myself before embarking on a video like this is then what can the Moon teach us? Is it really worth it to study the features on the Moon? Will there ever be a practical use for this information? I mean, there must be, right? After all, we spent nearly 10 years and billions of dollars just getting to the moon to take some samples and plan on doing the same plus even more in the upcoming years. And we wouldn't do all this if there wasn't some greater reason, right? Well, the answers to all these questions are what we're here today to figure out. So let's get started. The first and really only thing to understand about the moon is that it's a cold, dead world. It's clear just by looking at it that not much happens in a place like this. But well, why? I mean, think about it. The Earth is the only planet we know for sure lies within the habitable zone of our sun. But being our companion, this means the moon occupies virtually the same position as us, where it's not too hot, not too cold, and liquid water can theoretically exist. But it only takes a quick look back to the surface to remind us that this isn't the case. Despite sharing the limelight with the Earth, the Moon remains cold, and this in and of itself constitutes a mystery worth solving. Knowing that the Moon's position relative to the Sun definitely isn't the reason behind its lifelessness, our only option is to look at what other differences exist between the Moon and the Earth. Perhaps the most noticeable of these is their sizes. With a radius of 1,700 kilometers, the Moon measures in at just a little over a quarter of the size of the Earth, making it in fact the biggest Moon relative to the size of its parent planet in the whole solar system. Thanks to the square cube rule, however, this means the Moon has a volume of only 0.02 times that of the Earth's, or in other words, <laughs> drastically less. Just like Mars, this smaller size had the effect of allowing the inside of the Moon to cool down much faster than the Earth, freezing the majority of its core into solid rock over a very short period of time after its formation. Without a large quantity of molten iron churning at its core, the Moon couldn't support a protective magnetosphere, leaving its surface vulnerable to the constant bombardment of radiation from the Sun, stripping off any primordial atmosphere the young Moon might have had, and locking all volcanism deep within its body so that it could never build a new one. 
Overall, it's starting to look like the moon's size is wholly to blame for its lack of most geological processes. However, if seen in the scale of the entire solar system, we'll find the moon is actually quite large, ranking as the ninth biggest terrestrial object out there, bigger than even Pluto, and sitting between two of Jupiter's moons, Io on the larger side and Europa on the smaller side. But looking closer at what are, at least in terms of size, the moon's closest analogs, we'll find two very different stories. The surface of Io, for example, reveals an incredibly dynamic world, cluing us into the molten geology contained beneath its rocky crust. Jupiter fills the sky when viewed from the surface of Io, the innermost and smallest of the Galilean moons. Its bizarre colored surface is an ever-changing pattern of the vivid reds and yellows of frozen sulfur. Featuring over 400 volcanoes, with more than 150 of which being currently active, this in fact qualifies Io as the most geologically active body in the entire solar system. This activity, in turn, has led to the buildup of a number of substantial features all across the moon's surface, not least of which being Pele, the supermassive volcano whose sulfuric ejections have painted an orange ring around itself, serving as a clear sign of just how lively of a place this really is. It's from here that we've even witnessed the process of atmosphere building, as the volcano occasionally releases huge amounts of primarily gaseous sulfur dioxide into its surroundings. In the distance is an active volcano. It erupts, spewing hot sulfur and gas 200 miles above the surface, and falling back in a plume that spreads over a distance of 600 miles. Unfortunately, the tremendous gravity of Jupiter, Io's parent planet, ends up stealing most of these gases away, leaving Io's atmosphere razor thin, though it's not for a lack of trying. As Io moves in its orbit around Jupiter, it creates a unique relationship with the planet's magnetic field. Clouds of trapped radiation in the magnetic field sweep past Io and strip away one ton of sulfur and oxygen atoms each second into space. Nevertheless, as a whole, despite being only marginally larger than our moon, Io presents some of the most striking features of any terrestrial object in our solar system, rich with topographic details like mountains, valleys, canyons, plateaus, even these curious river-like features, and really can be thought of as more of a captured planet rather than just a moon. Io is the most spectacular of the Jovian moons. Its vivid, mottled surface with oddly shaped blotches of color mystify the scientists. Surely the strangest object ever seen in our solar system. Huh. Maybe I should have made this video about Io instead. Next time. By contrast, with Jupiter acting as the source of heating for all of its moons, Europa's position almost twice as far away from the gas giant as Io makes it a far colder world. That being said, if the Jovian moon's surface is again any clue, there's still a great deal happening here. Despite what it might look like here, we'll find the smoothest surface of any terrestrial object in the solar system. And the mechanism behind this smoothness is simple. Water. Lots of water. Partially composed of an estimated 3 billion cubic kilometers of water, or over twice the amount as the entire Earth contains, Europa's surface is not one of rock, but of ice. A material far more malleable than your typical stony silicates, allowing the moon's crust to be more easily manipulated under its own weight. We can see evidence for this all across the moon's surface, where these striations or lineae reveal where tension has built up within the water ice crust. Europa, the size of our moon, resembles a cracked billiard ball. But the complex markings are curiously flat, like stripes painted on the surface. Its icy crust is thought to float on an ocean melted by interior heat. In much the same way how beneath the Earth's rocky crust is a mantle of molten magma, here beneath Europa's icy outer layer lies an ocean of molten ice, otherwise known as liquid water, heated up by the warmth of the moon's core.
This allows the European surface to behave in similar ways to the Earth's, where solid plates flow over a molten subsurface, colliding and bouncing off one another to produce a system of plate tectonics. This, in turn, makes for an environment of perpetual surface renewal, giving rise to a unique and even signature European geography. By contrast, our own moon's surface has remained virtually unchanged for over 3 billion years, or basically ever since it cooled down after its formation. So what we've learned from this is that the moon's size isn't necessarily the only thing holding it back. The only other inherent trait this leaves us to look at is the composition of the rock itself. But let me save us all some time by saying this is another dead end. Having started its life as part of the Earth and part of the protoplanet Theia which collided into the Earth, the Moon has a more similar composition to our own home sweet home than any other body in the solar system. Overall, the Moon's optimal orbital positioning, its relatively large size, and its Earth-like geology all work in its favor rather than against it, and together make for a promising case, at least on paper. Or basically, there's nothing inherently wrong with the Moon itself. And so, to figure out why it fails to support even the most basic geologic, geographic, or biologic activity, despite all that it has going for it, now we need to look at what outside factors may be influencing this all. And it's by changing the framing of our question from why isn't the moon like the Earth to why isn't the moon even like these other moons that we might finally get our answer. You see, the problem isn't where the moon orbits, but rather what it orbits. For both Io and Europa, the tremendous gravitational sway of their parent planet Jupiter causes a huge amount of internal tension within the bodies of the moons. The only way for all of this pent-up energy to release itself is in the form of heat, supplying the inner two Jovian moons with an internal engine driving any and all geologic and even cryologic activity in their cores, which in turn serve as forces for change and resurfacing across their exteriors. That's why if we look even further away from Jupiter, where its gravity has less of an influence, we'll find objects far more comparable to our own moon, like Ganymede and Callisto, both of which measure even bigger than either Io or Europa, but nonetheless share the same cold, gray, cratered appearance characteristic of dead worlds due to their lack of internal heating. Ganymede is as large as the planet Mercury. Its dark, ancient terrain is spotted with white impact scars. Adjacent areas are cut by jumbled patterns of grooves and ridges. Callisto is the outermost of the four large moons. Every inch of its surface bears the scars of billions of years of cratering. If it were our moon in the position of one of these inner two, there's no doubt it too would be a more active place, though it would also still likely struggle to hold onto its atmosphere, resulting in a geologic world, perhaps yes, even a geographic one. But a biologic one? Mm, probably not. But at the very least it would have a more interesting surface than it does now. Unfortunately, at least for the moon anyway, it orbits a much smaller body, the Earth, whose gravity isn't nearly as strong as that of the giant Jupiter, and so the internal heat sources driving change across the surfaces of the Jovian moons simply aren't present here. That's not to say the Earth-Moon system doesn't generate any internal heating, a look at a bisection of the Moon does in fact reveal a small nucleus of molten rock at its core, but rather this is just not enough heating to affect the lunar surface. Though now, I can't help but wonder if the Moon had gotten just a little bit more rocky material and maybe the Earth a little less, is there any scenario where both the Earth and the Moon have the proper sizes to maintain molten cores and in turn develop life independent of one another? I mean, after all, if you add up their masses and divide by two, you'd not only get two larger than Mars sized objects, they'd both have nearly five times Mars's mass, meaning theoretically the collision that created the moon could have resulted in two bodies capable of supporting volcanism, an atmosphere, and maybe even liquid water for a time. 
But of course, as it stands now, the moon's mostly solid core means there are no processes to renew the surface. No erosion, no volcanoes, no change whatsoever leaving its geography as a canvas for asteroids to paint with craters, giving the moon its only discernible features. That's not to say there aren't any notable craters here, which yeah sure I guess I'll take us through a few, but trust me, it gets pretty repetitive after a while. Taking another look at the surface map of the moon, we can see, well, <laughs> pretty much nothing. Just like Mars and Venus, without something like water to show us the differences between raised features like continents and depressed features like basins, maps for worlds like this just end up looking like one unending flat landscape, and so we're better off looking at an elevation map instead. Doing this, we'll see a chaotic landscape emerge, but one that at the very least can be divided into essentially three regions. The one that stands out the most to me, no pun intended, is this stretch of elevated lands running through its center, the closest thing to what you could call a lunar continent. But I'll admit, after a full day of searching, I could not find a name to refer to this structure as a whole besides the Far Side Highlands, which is really less of a name and more of a description, being in fact the highlands on the far side of the moon. It would appear that while planets with more organized geographies like Mars and Venus get to have cool names like Tharsis or Aphrodite Terra to describe the most substantial buildups of rock on their crust, the disorder that comes from a heavily cratered surface like the moons means that its names end up being less figurative and more directly tied to what they're assigned to. And the best I could do was find a name for this area, the point of highest elevation across the whole surface, called the Selenian Summit. Something I could see having been called a name like Selenia had this plateau not become fractured beyond recognition by subsequent cratering. Though even this is a vague term, considering the summit isn't an actual mountain or even a mountain range, but rather just a collection of plateaus sitting between craters, and so there's still some question as to what's even considered part of this designation. Is this the Selenian summit, or is this, or this, or this, or this, or you see what I mean? Basically nothing's readable on a world like this, even with an elevation map, it's all too random. In an astronomical sense, the moon's surface is the equivalent of static on a monitor. Complicated, sure, but meaningful? I don't know about that. If we want actual mountains, we're gonna have to look around the other side of the moon, the near side, at craters like the Mare Imbrium. Here, the collision that produced this ancient crater kicked up a huge amount of debris around its perimeter, leaving the Apennine Mountains and further down the Caucasus Mountains, or as their Latin names go, the Montes Apenninus and the Montes Caucasus. By all measures, these are the closest things the moon has to bona fide mountain ranges, though to be honest, that's not saying much. Being the more built up of the two, the Apennines are where the moon's tallest peaks are to be found, with Mons Bradley, M Mons Hadley, Mons Hadley Delta, and highest of them all, Mons Hudgens, though even Wikipedia shies away from calling this a true mountain, instead giving it the title the moon's tallest hill. But okay, if it's still hard to picture what any of this looks like relative to the scale of, say, a human, well, lucky for us, this was the target site for the 1971 NASA mission Apollo 15, where astronauts Jim Irwin, David Scott, and Alfred Warden landed, explored, and even got to drive around the Hadley Apennine region, taking pictures like this one all along the way, where Jim Irwin stands in front of Mons Hadley, giving us at least some sense of what these features look like from the ground. Five miles above the moon, Dave Scott and Jim Irwin looked out the window of their lunar module down toward Al Warden in the command module, which had completed its separation maneuver. Beneath them, the 15,000-foot peaks of the lunar Apennine Mountains. Soon they would fly low over those peaks on their way to a landing in a little valley in the mountains of the moon. Eight feet minus one. Contact. Or you know, better yet, why don't we just watch some videos taken from under these mountains and hear what the people who actually witnessed them had to say. Oh, what a big mountain that Hadley is. Yeah, it's beautiful. The sun is really fierce. 
It's also here besides Mons Hadley that we'll find the feature we can hear the astronauts refer to as Hadley Rill, or if you prefer its Latin name, Rima Hadley, a meandering channel that at first glance appears not unlike a riverbed. Coming right. Out their window, they could see the sinuous meanderings of the lunar canyon known as Hadley Rill as they brought their lunar module, call sign Falcon, toward its landing and the beginning of what would be one of the most significant chapters in the history of scientific exploration. A closer look at this feature, however, reveals this valley to be far too big to have been formed by water, but rather is the result of an ancient lava tube collapsing in on itself, producing what can only be described as the Grand Canyon of the Moon. As a whole, the Hadley Apennine region serves as one of the most interesting features anywhere on the lunar landscape, which is only made more amazing by the fact that we have actual footage from this place. It's a big rock there. It sure is. Let's go down and get the chunk of the bedrock here. Get a little closer so you get that big chip out of there. Boy, what a rock. Overall, features like the Selenian Summit and the Montes Apenninus show us that without more substantial forces like volcanism or tectonics at play, the highest parts of any celestial object's surface simply end up being wherever asteroids by chance haven't totally obliterated the landscape. But of course, in order to have areas of high elevation, you must also have areas of low elevation. And so on either side of this Selenian landmass, if you can even call it that, we'll find two equally massive basins. The more pronounced of these is the South Pole Aitken Basin, located, well yeah, roughly around the moon's South Pole, meaning we're better off looking at this feature using a sphere rather than a flat map caused by, you guessed it, a massive impact early in the moon's life, possibly even as it was still forming, we can tell how truly ancient this crater is by all the other, smaller craters that have come to cover the basin's floor since then. It's inside one of these, the Antoniani Crater, where we'll find yet another, even smaller, unnamed crater, where the lowest point across the entire lunar surface can be found. Though in truth there is some debate between this and another unnamed crater inside the nearby Lemaitre Crater. And again, all this confusion about where the highest and lowest points on the surface are all have to do with the highly chaotic nature of the landscape. Around the other side of the Selenian summit, we'll find another series of craters, altogether referred to as the Lunar Maria, that add up to the moon's second major basin, and being on the face of the moon we can actually see from the Earth, some of these you might recognize. Switching our map back over to a simple surface map, we'll find these Maria to be really the only discernible features across the whole landscape. But to understand why these basins stand out from the rest, we need to look at a new kind of map, one I don't think we've ever looked at on this channel before. This is a geological map published only last year, and what it shows is the different kinds of lunar soils present at the surface. While something like this can surely be a lot to take in, for our purposes all we need to look at is this big pink area directly corresponding to this series of basins. What this pink color indicates is basaltic lava flows, which I know this whole time I've been saying there's no volcanism on the moon, so what the heck. But long story short, very early in the moon's formation, before its core had time to fully cool, this wasn't the case. Just like anything else, as the surface cooled, it shrank, causing a series of cracks to form, eventually turning into rift valleys, from which magma from the moon's still molten core spilled out, laying down several large flat plains of dark volcanic rock that stand out from the rest. 
It was in turn this darkness that led early astronomers to mistake these basins for massive seas, explaining how they got names like Oceanus Procellarum or the Ocean of Storms, Mare Imbrium or the Sea of Rain, Mare Serenitatis or the Sea of Serenity, the Sea of Tranquility, the Sea of Fertility, the Sea of Vapors, the Sea of Clouds, the Sea of Moisture, oh but this one might be my favorite, Mare Cognitum or the Sea that has become known. And of course, all their names together, the Lunar Maria, simply translates to the seas of the moon. Overall, while the moon's geography gives us little to talk about beyond craters and, well, more craters, it's also quite revealing. What it shows us is that this is what a dead world looks like. And so knowing this, anytime we find a planet or moon with a similar geography like Mercury or Ganymede or Callisto, or maybe even eventually exoplanets beyond our own solar system, if all we know about a celestial object is that its surface looks like this, then we already have all the information we need to be sure that no geologic activity exists to build mountains, no volcanoes exist to build an atmosphere, and no water exists to erode valleys. And therefore, we don't need to waste any more of our time looking closer at these sorts of places trying to figure out if life is present. But here's the weird thing, that might not be true forever. Despite all that's been said, what makes the moon so unique is that while it is lifeless and sterile, thanks to its proximity to the Earth, it's the only other place in the solar system where life has been. And so it's also the most likely place to harbor life, not now, not in the past, but in the future. NASA scientists feel that the very first base on the moon might consist of a series of modules brought to the moon's surface and buried in order to provide protection from cosmic radiation and the harsh lunar environment. After the base camp, there would be an evolving complex, depending very much upon lunar resources for building materials. You see, without the same gravity and atmosphere as the Earth's, launching spacecraft from the moon is exponentially easier and maybe more importantly cheaper than launching from here, meaning as our aspirations as a species climb further and further into space, it's likely the moon will only become busier and busier of a place. Pretty soon, the moon's advantages as a jumping off point to the rest of the solar system will bring engineers and scientists here to construct new missions, be it Mars rovers, new space telescopes, or simply more satellites. And this could serve as the economic foundation that in turn draws even more people like miners, manufacturers, construction workers, and all the jobs that go along with establishing and maintaining such a presence. Concrete is one of several materials being investigated for building on the moon, according to Dr. Wendell Mendel, planetary scientist at the Johnson Space Center. If you can make a brick on the moon and you don't have to import the brick from the Earth, then you've saved an enormous amount of money by uh, not having to ship the mass of the transportation system. So that's a tremendous incentive for learning to use lunar materials. Once we figure out how to mine and refine materials in C2, this opens up the possibilities even further to where factories, even entire industries, could move operations here to escape the costly environmental toll their work has on the planet. The moon could even one day replace the Earth as our main source of raw materials like iron and aluminum. While initial populations may remain small, pretty soon the cost of shipping water, food, and oxygen from the Earth to the Moon will exceed the cost of simply extracting water from below the Moon's surface and using it to grow food, produce breathable air, and even manufacture rocket fuel all on site. Once this happens, somehow life will have found a way to sustain itself here, despite all of the challenges standing in the way, and the moon will become only the second known object in the solar system to support its own biology. To escape the extreme temperatures, the moon station would probably be underground, where the temperature remains more moderate. It would need a source of power. Green plants might be used to produce oxygen within the station the station would have to be sealed to retain its artificial atmosphere. Probably the only parts of the station on the surface would be observation domes, entrance ports, and radio antennas. 
While life on the moon might look radically different from the kind we're used to seeing here on Earth, well, the same could be said for any form of alien life, especially one in such a radically inhospitable place like this. And so if we manage to figure out a way to survive here, there's really no limits to where else humans could expand to given the right economic drivers. In fact, we might even find it easier to colonize these sorts of worlds as they provide a reliably constant and therefore safe environment where supervolcanoes, sulfuric atmospheres, or even other forms of life don't pose such catastrophic risks. Ultimately, despite its inhospitable nature, the moon will nonetheless serve as our key to the rest of the solar system, a jumping off point for centuries of exploration, a place that teaches us how to expand beyond our home. Or in other words, our move to the moon will be one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Oh, that looks beautiful from here. It has a stark beauty all its own. It's uh, like much of the high desert of the uh, United States. It's uh, different, but it's very pretty out here. Hey everyone, thanks for watching. So what do you think? Did I answer my questions from the beginning of this video? Was the moon worth learning about? Let me know in the comments. If you enjoyed and would like to see more of these kinds of videos, well, I decided I'm going to do something that other YouTubers have done, but I never thought I'd be doing. Considering these space videos take a bit more out of me than most, I'm going to need to make sure that you guys are on board for more. So I'm only going to make another one of these if this video gets 30,000 likes? Yeah, 30,000 likes. Oh man, I already hate myself for saying that. Okay, and of course, if you want to help this channel sustain life, you can go over to my Patreon. The link will be on the screen or in the description where you can support me and get your name up here like these generous folks. Other than that, uh, subscribe already so that I can finally get to a million and get something on that part of my wall. Uh, like the video. Oh, I already said that. And I guess check out my other videos on space geography if you're new here. Thanks.